So welcome to Unit 12, Abnormal Behavior, Module 68, Schizophrenia. And these slides correspond to align with whatever Meyer Psychology uh, for the AP course, third edition. Um, it is a fairly long module. Let's see how many learning targets there are. Five learning targets. The first one is describe the patterns of perceiving, thinking, and feeling that characterize schizophrenia. Oh, I didn't tell you the title of it. It's module 68, schizophrenia. Um, the second learning target is to contrast chronic schizophrenia and acute schizophrenia, then discuss the brain abnormalities associated with schizophrenia, discuss the prenatal events associated with the risk of developing it, discuss how genes influence schizophrenia, and identify the factors that may be early warning signs of schizophrenia in children. So consider this quote, the regulator that funnels certain information to you and filters out other information suddenly shuts off. Immediately, every sight, every sound, every smell coming at you carries equal weight. Every thought, feeling, memory, and idea presents itself to you with an equally strong and demanding intensity. So what is schizophrenia? It's a disorder characterized by delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, and or diminished inappropriate emotional expression, what's called your affect. During the most severe periods, people with schizophrenia live in a private inner world, preoccupied with the strange ideas and images that haunt them. The word itself means split, schizo, mind. Okay, so that means split mind. It refers not to what some people think mistakenly, multiple personalities, but it refers to mind split from reality. So that's a, that's a common um, psycho myth that, that schizophrenia is multiple personalities and that is not true. That is dissociative disorder, which we will talk about um, as well. What are some positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia? So the positive, don't think positive means they're good things, okay? These are just, <laughs> they um, are, that is not what is meant by positive here. Those with positive symptoms with schizophrenia may experience hallucinations, talk in disorganized and diluted ways and exhibit inappropriate laughter, tear or rage. So just sort of inappropriate emotional expressions for the situation. Negative symptoms on the other hand, um, those that have negative symptoms may exhibit an absence of emotions or a lack of emotion in their voices, ex being expressionless on their in terms of their face or unmoving bodies, sort of really rigid bodies that aren't sort of reacting in the way that they should. So if you're taking the AP exam, here's a tip. When psychologists refer to positive and negative schizophrenia symptoms, the terms, again, don't mean good or bad. That's something that's really important to remember. Symptoms are positive and negative in a mathematical sense, adding or subtracting behaviors. So not like value-based, not like good and bad, right? So adding or subtracting behaviors. In the case of schizophrenia, positive symptoms are inappropriate behaviors that are present, and negative symptoms are appropriate behaviors that are not present. So how about what do we mean when we hear the term hallucination? What's well, a false sensory experience or perception such as seeing something in the absence of an external visual stimulus? So people with schizophrenia sometimes have hallucinations in different sensory domains. They see, feel, taste, or smell things that exist only in their minds. The auditory hallucinations tend to be voices which sometimes make insulting remarks or give orders. So for instance, the voices may tell the person that she's bad or that she must burn herself with a cigarette later or something terrible like that could be what the voices are telling a person with schizophrenia. Now a delusion is a false belief, often a persecution or a delusion of grandeur that may, that, that may accompany psychotic disorders. People with schizophrenia also have disorganized, fragmented thinking often distorted by false beliefs called delusions. If they have paranoid tendencies, they may believe they're being threatened or pursued. So one cause of disorganized thinking may be a breakdown in what we call selective attention. So if you think back, if you've listened to these other modules, module 16, think back to that, we normally have, we normally have a remarkable capacity to give our undivided attention to one set of sensory stimuli while filtering out the others. 
But people with schizophrenia are easily distracted by tiny unrelated stimuli, such as the grooves on a brick or tones in, in a voice. So consider this case. Maxine, a young woman with schizophrenia, believed that she was Mary Poppins. Communicating with Maxine was difficult because her thoughts spilled out in no logical order. Her biographer, Susan Sheehan, observed her saying aloud to no one in particular, this morning when I was at Hillsdale Hospital, I was making a movie. I was surrounded by movie stars. Is this room painted blue to get me upset? My grandmother died four weeks after my 18th birthday. Okay, so you can see how that speech is very atypical. So disorganized speech, like what Maxine was showing, is a positive symptom of schizophrenia. As with Maxine in the previous slide, jumbles idea, jumbled ideas make no sense, even within sentences, forming what is called within psychology a word salad. So for instance, one young man begs for a little more allegro in the treatment and set, suggested that liberationary movement with a view to the widening of the horizon will ergo extort some wit in lectures, right? So none that doesn't make any sense, right? So that's what's known as word salad. How are emotions inappropriately expressed in schizophrenia? The expressed emotions of schizophrenia are often utterly inappropriate, split off from reality. Maxine laughed after recalling her grandmother's death. Totally inappropriate reaction to her grandmother's death. On other occasions, she cried when others laughed or became angry for no apparent reason. So her emotions were inappropriate for the particular situations. How are emotions diminished in schizophrenia? Well, some people diagnosed with schizophrenia lapse into an emotionless flat affect, the state of no apparent feeling. Most people with schizophrenia have an impaired theory of mind as well. We've talked about this if you listen to some of the other earlier modules. They have difficulty perceiving facial expressions and reading other state of mind, states of mind. We also mentioned earlier that this was something, uh, an impaired theory of mind is often seen in individuals with autism. Unable to understand others' mental states, those with schizophrenia struggle to feel sympathy and compassion. How might motor behavior be inappropriate or disruptive? Well, those with schizophrenia may experience catatonia, characterized by motor behaviors ranging from a physical stupor, remaining motionless for hours sometimes, to senseless compulsive actions, such as continually rocking or rubbing an arm, to severe and dangerous agitation. So what does research show about the prevalence and development of schizophrenia? Well, this year, one in 100 people will join an estimated 21 million others worldwide who have schizophrenia. The disorder knows no national boundaries, and it typically strikes as young people are maturing into adulthood. Men tend to be struck earlier, more severely, and more often. Chronic schizophrenia is a form of schizophrenia in which symptoms usually appear by late adolescence or early adulthood. As people age, psychotic episodes last longer and recovery periods shorten. Social withdrawal, a negative symptom, is often found among those with chronic schizophrenia. Men whose schizophrenia develops an, on average four years earlier than women, interestingly, more often exhibit negative schizophrenia and chronic schizophrenia. Now, acute schizophrenia is a form of schizophrenia that can begin at any age, frequently occurs in response to a traumatic event. When previously well-adjusted people develop schizophrenia rapidly following particular life stresses, this is called acute schizophrenia, and recovery is likely. People with this acute form more often have positive symptoms that are more um, treatable through drug therapy. So how might dopamine be associated with schizophrenia? Well, researchers studying the brain of schizophrenia patients after death found an excess number of dopamine receptors, including a six-fold excess for the dopamine receptor D4. A hyper-responsive dopamine system may intensify brain signals in schizophrenia, creating positive symptoms such as those hallucinations and paranoia. Drugs that block dopamine receptors receptors called antagonists often lessen these symptoms. Drugs that increase dopamine levels called agonists such as amphetamines, cocaine, those kind of things sometimes can intensify schizophrenia symptoms. So psychologist E. Fuller Torrey has collected the brains of hundreds of those who died as young adults and suffered disorders such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Um, 
And some of the, we're going to talk about some of the information that's been found about uh, the brains of individuals with schizophrenia. Some people diagnosed with schizophrenia have abnormally low brain activity in those frontal lobes, areas that are involved in reasoning, planning, and solving problems. Many studies have also found enlarged fluid-filled ventricles and a corresponding shrinkage and thinning of cerebral tissue. So what about prenatal events? Are there any things, any prenatal events associated with schizophrenia? Well, some scientists believe mishaps during prenatal development or delivery cause brain abnormalities in people with schizophrenia. Risk factors include low birth weight, maternal diabetes, older paternal age, and oxygen deprivation during delivery. So how about other things. How about viral infections? Is there any association with schizophrenia? Well, fetal virus infections may increase the odds that a child will develop schizophrenia. However, many women get the flu during their second trimester of pregnancy and only 2% of them bear children who develop schizophrenia. So it is higher um, than the 1%, the but it's, there's a lot of people that do have the flu and they don't, the, kids, the babies don't end up um, later developing schizophrenia. Um, so it increases the risk, but it isn't a definite by any means. Is there a genetic component to schizophrenia? The one in 100 odds of any person being diagnosed with schizophrenia become about one in 10 among those having a sibling or parent with the disorder. So that's a pretty strong clue that there is a genetic component to schizophrenia. So the lifetime risk of developing schizophrenia varies with one's genetic relatedness to someone having this disorder. Okay, so you can see there's a much stronger, higher risk for those monozygotic identical twins than fraternal twins. Across countries, barely more than one in 10 fraternal twins, but some five in 10 identical twins share a schizophrenia diagnosis. About two thirds of identical twins also share a placenta in the blood it supplies. The other third have separate placentas. If the co-twin and if ident an identical twin with schizophrenia shared the placenta, the chances of developing the disorder are six in 10. If the identical twins had separate placentas, the co-twin's chance of developing schizophrenia dropped to about one in 10. That's very, very interesting. So twins who share a placenta are more likely to share the same prenatal viruses. So perhaps shared germs as well as shared genes produce identical twin similarities. What about brain changes? Which ones are evident in the identical twin with schizophrenia? When twins differ, only the one afflicted with schizophrenia typically has enlarged fluid-filled cranial cavities, like on the right. The difference between the twins implies some non-genetic factor, such as a virus, is also at work. So adoption studies help sort of untangle the genetic, that nature and environmental, the nurture influences. Children adopted by someone who develops schizophrenia do not catch the disorder. Rather, adopted children have an elevated risk if a biological parent is diagnosed with schizophrenia. So what does this tell us? This tells us that genes matter a great deal in the development of schizophrenia, in addition to the environment, for sure, but the genes really matter. So schizophrenia is a group of disorders influenced by many genes, each with very small effects, polygenic variants, polygenic effect. And as so often seen, nature and nurture interact. We've seen that woven throughout all of these modules in this class, so that there is an interaction between nature and nurture with the development of different disorders. What is the relationship between smoking and schizophrenia? Well, most people with schizophrenia smoke. Smoking increases vulnerability to schizophrenia and contributes to people with schizophrenia having a 14.5 year shorter than average life expectancy. That's quite significant. So what about epigenetic factors? So if we think back, we've talked about epigenetics in the past or in, this, um, in these modules. Recall that epigenetic factors influence whether genes will actually be expressed, sort of turned on. Environmental factors such as viral infections, nutritional deprivation, and maternal stress can turn on the genes that put some people that have a genetic predisposition at higher risk for schizophrenia. So heredity, your nature, and life experiences nurture, they work together. 
So what are some early warning signs of schizophrenia? Hoping to identify environmental triggers of schizophrenia, researchers have compared the experiences of high-risk children, for example, those with relatives with schizophrenia, and low-risk children. In one two-and-a-half-year study that followed 163 teens in early, in early 20s adults who had two relatives with schizophrenia, the 20% of participants who developed schizophrenia showed social withdrawal or other abnormal behavior before the onset of the disorder. So researchers identified other possible warning signs, including a mother whose schizophrenia was severe and long-lasting, birth complications, separation from parents, short attention span and poor muscle control, disruptive or withdrawn behavior, emotional unpredictability, poor peer relations and solo play, not playing with others, and childhood physical, sexual, or emotional abuse. So we're back to the learning targets. So people with schizophrenia display symptoms that are positive, like inappropriate behaviors that are present, or negative, appropriate behaviors that are absent. Positive symptoms may include hallucinations, talking in a disorganized way, and inappropriate laughter, tears, or rage. Negative symptoms may include toneless voices, expressionless faces, or mute and rigid bodies. In chronic schizophrenia, the disorder develops gradually and recovery is doubtful. In acute schizophrenia, the onset is sudden. It develops in reaction to some sort of stressor and the prospects for recovery are brighter. So people with schizophrenia have increased dopamine receptors, which may intensify brain signals, creating positive symptoms such as hallucinations and paranoia. Brain abnormalities associated with schizophrenia include enlarged, fluid-filled areas and corresponding shrinkage and thinning of cerebral tissue. Brain scans also reveal abnormal activity in the frontal lobes, thalamus, amygdala, as well as a loss of neural connections across the brain network. So some possible contributing factors to schizophrenia include maternal diabetes, older paternal age, viral infections, or famine condition during the mother's pregnancy, and low weight or oxygen deprivation at birth. Twin and adoption studies indicate that the predisposition to schizophrenia is inherited. It's influenced by many genes, each with small effect. So it's a bunch of genes, not just one gene. There's no single gene that anyone's identified. There's a lot of genes involved. Environmental factors, including those present in the prenatal environment, may influence gene expression to enable this disorder. While no environmental cause, causes invari invariably produce schizophrenia, possible early warning signs of later development include some biological factors, a mother who had severe and long-lasting schizophrenia, birth complications, short attention span, and poor muscle control. Some psychological factors um, that are warning signs are disruptive or withdrawn behavior, emotional unpredictability, poor peer relations and solo play, separation from parents, and child abuse. Okay, that's all for this module. Thanks for listening. Take care.